Welcome to the Non-Obvious Insight Show. I'm your host, Rob Pradava, and every week I go through hundreds of news sources to curate the most interesting and underappreciated stories that you might have missed. This week, we'll be talking about the resurgence in Italy of the 17th century sales technique, the one thing that could eliminate fake news, Japan's toxic kawaii culture, a sibling rivalry that helped, that helped create the world's best-selling cookie, how to experience the last blockbuster store in America, and why flying cars might become a reality sooner than you think. All that and an unusual selection for the non-obvious book release of the week are coming in just a few seconds. We are live streaming to Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope, and the show starts right now. Happy Thursday, non-obvious nation. We are back, and you might notice that I am not in my usual location. We are in an SD uh, spot, and in our SD spot, we are focused on um, uh, trying to recreate the show as much as we can and uh, do it with a little bit lower res than usual. So uh, one of the things that I want to start off with is a big, big story that has... Um, kind of caught my attention because it was one of the biggest uh, insights about media right now that uh, I had probably thought about at some point, but never really kind of focused on, which is what does it take to get past this whole idea of fake news, like fake everything? And, you know, one of the things that I found when it came to fake news and fake everything is that you see a lot of stories where you are getting a perspective and you're like, well, that doesn't seem quite right. Like that doesn't seem like it's the full story. And then we fact check it afterwards. And what happens when we fact check it afterwards is, is the lie exists for a long time. And there was an amazing article this week from a journalist who talked about the one thing that could eliminate fake news. And, and what he talked about was just this experience of being a live journalist and having to prepare for an interview with a difficult interviewee, somebody who might be inclined to, to uh, lie or just not take uh, any question at face value and sort of shift the question. I mean, people who have great media training, how do you deal with an interviewee like that? And he spotlighted the interview that many of you may have seen with a journalist named Jonathan Swan, uh, who interviewed President Trump and challenged him at multiple points on things that he said that were basically made up. And on the spot, he said, well, actually, that's not true because of this. And one of the most interesting things about this point that that uh, the the journalist who, who wrote this talked about is that we need to see more of that. Like we need to see more media examples of uh, moments in time when we get uh, that live fact checking because the challenge is like we don't see that as often. And so because we don't see that as often, uh, we try and fact check after the point. And when we fact check after the point, it's really not the same because that thing's been out there for a while. And I just thought that was such a great insight that really could change a lot. And it, and the challenge is, and the reason why it doesn't happen as often is it's really tough. I mean, how, it, just imagine being the journalist, like trying to prepare for any possible falsehood that somebody could say in an interview and having your level of preparation in terms of knowing the facts, knowing the numbers off the top of your head, because like, as soon as you like fumble around for those papers, you lose the credibility, right? Because it's not off the top of your head. And it was such an interesting challenge that, that they laid down and he laid down in this, that I just, it, it made me think. And, and, and I thought that was just a really, really important insight. So that was my lead story. And it was about journalism and the importance of doing that live story in a certain way. Another story that, uh, that kind of went backwards in history. And, and, and one of the things you might've noticed if you get my weekly email every week is that this week I had perhaps a little bit more historical stories than usual. And it might be because I'm traveling this week and so I have a little bit more time to read. And so I've, I've, I've done more of the kind of long read uh, type read, the so-called quote unquote long reads, the things that usually we uh, don't have time to read. And so maybe I was reading more of those. And, and this was one of those, which I thought was, was really fascinating. There's apparently these wine windows in Italy, in Tuscany, that they had started using in the 17th century because wine cellars, uh, they had a plague at that time, and so they didn't want to catch anything. That was one reason. But wine cellars also wanted to avoid taxes. And so one of the ways they avoided taxes is they used these windows so they could kind of secretly hand somebody some wine and they wouldn't have to pay the usual taxes. 
And these wine windows are apparently now, hundreds of years later, being reused to help uh, deliver wine in a, a coronavirus society. And it was just this great reminder for me that sometimes the moment we're in, in in history like seems totally unlike any other moment in the past. And then you see something like these wine windows that someone created at a time when there was a plague hundreds of years ago. And you remember that there's so much stuff, so much of the situations that we live through that someone at some point in history had to live through also and come up with a solution for. And if we could just remember those solutions, if we could just go backwards in history a little bit, we'd see some of those solutions for ourselves. And that's just a, a reminder, I think, of the importance of history. And what you'll see actually in my selection for the non-obvious book release of the week is an example of how we should be teaching history to kids and to ourselves probably, not uh, the way we currently do, because I don't understand why history is ever boring. I mean, this is just, this is a class listening to stories. How can that be boring? But we make it boring because we focus on like memorizing the facts and stuff like that. And so there's ways of doing that differently. I'm going to come back to that, I promise, because uh, there's a really great, great book that I want to recommend for all of you that just came out this week uh, that I think might offer a little bit of a unusual and, and yes, non-obvious way of thinking about this. So we're going to share that story a little bit later on, but let's move on to the next story. And like I said, I've been very retrospective in terms of sharing stories and going backwards in history. And this story about Oreos was one that that I just found so interesting from a branding point of view, because I'm a brand guy and I love brand stories. And uh, this one was about a sibling rivalry that basically started uh, about, I think, about 100 years ago with two brothers who founded competing bakeries, and they had different interests and different ideas for how to make that bakery popular. And there were two types of cookies. There was a cookie called the Hydrox, and then there was the Oreo. And they competed, and they were very similar. And if you Google it, you can actually still buy the Hydrox cookie. So it's still out there. Um, available, but the Oreo clearly won. And as you read the history of this story, one of the interesting things that emerges is why it won. And there were two big things that the article that I read pointed to. The first was that they shifted the price point to make it seem more like a premium cookie. And it was a right around the time when the Hydrox was suffering because of its brand name, because Hydrox sounds like a type of cleaner. It doesn't sound like a cookie, apparently. And, and in the 1950s, when more cleaning supplies were coming out, that sort of sounded like the Hydrox, the brand name didn't end up being a, an asset for them. But the other big thing that they pointed to was the fact that Oreo went and uh, created this partnership for cookies and cream ice cream. And cookies and cream ice cream helped propel the Oreo as well. And, and it was just another one of those brand reminders on so many levels that that one you've got to line up your name of your brand so that it's something that will be successful over time which sometimes you can predict and sometimes maybe you can't uh but the other piece was that sometimes it might be that amazing partnership that helps you jump from where you are to that next phase to that next level and that's kind of what happened for oreos and so this was just a story of that and it was some really good reminders from a brand point of view of what you might want to think about and what the you know what the what the idea could be Another story this week, which was a very international one, and actually this one wasn't a brand new story. It's actually been written by a, a uh, freelance writer about a year ago, but was so relevant. And I remember the first time when we went to Japan, I noticed this, this very, very uh, predominantly in the billboards, the posters, the stuff you see in bookstores, like just all over the place, this kawaii culture, this culture of cute which the article talks about as being this celebration of the sort of shy female feminine characters. And you see this a lot in anime and a lot of the, the characters and the way they're depicted. And what this article talked about is how that's holding women back in many ways in J Japanese culture. And I think that yeah, I was just having a conversation about this and, and, and just the mix of places that progress culture and places that move it backwards. And I think in, in our culture here in America, there's so many places where if you think about business or TV shows or um, movies, there are places where the culture is being driven forward in terms of seeing very empowered uh, females in leading roles. And, and it's just like an amazing thing to see. But then you look at 
other parts of our culture, like for example, uh, the music culture. And if you watch any music video, pretty much right now, pretty much what you'll see is girls in bikinis dancing and the opposite of female empowerment. And the entire industry of music kind of seems like that. That's the way that, that women are portrayed, even the women who are music stars portraying themselves. And, you know, that's one of those things that I think is just uh, such a challenge. Um, and so that was one of the things that this made me think about. Uh, another big story this this week was a new documentary trailer that was pretty unusual, not for the person associated with it, though. I mean, the, the trailer was narrated by Morgan Freeman. And the documentary apparently is as well. And he's a pretty usual choice, though uh, probably a high-priced one for these documentaries. But this documentary focused on what they called a new ocean species that lives for thousands of years, doesn't have any teeth, and yet threatens to overtake all uh, animal life in the oceans uh, in the next 50 years. And as you watch it for a little bit of time, it's revealed that that's this ocean predator is actually plastic, plastic bags. And it's just such a nicely done trailer where you get it as you're going through it, but it really offers this sobering insight about like how big of a challenge this really is. And this trailer is really well done. And it just reminds us of how big of a problem this, this is going to be and has already become. And in a creative way, in an interesting and new creative way. So I think that with, with a topic like this, perhaps one of the downsides is that like we humans need constant reminders of why it's a big problem because something else more urgent always comes up. And now all of a sudden we're like more worried about wearing masks than we are about the plastic in the oceans that we might have really cared about a lot a year ago. And then we forget. And so we need constant reminders and things like this to get us to refocus on these big problems as we try and solve some of the smaller problems that we're facing right now as well. And so we've got like both of these things. And I know that there's like lots of problems. So I don't want to like, like, hey, if you're not focused on solving problems right now, like, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. Uh, that's not my point. My point is like, sometimes creativity is the way that we can bring more attention to these things that really matter. And I thought this video was an excellent, excellent way of doing that. So, um, one of the things that uh, that I also uh, read about, just going back to the coronavirus, was this uh, idea of celebrating the winners. And I think a lot of times in media, what we see right now is this depiction of certain countries that are beating the virus. And that's the word, that's the terminology we're using. It's beating the virus versus uh, countries that aren't. And then you see news about New Zealand and how they had eliminated the coronavirus. And then recently they had another case or they had like two cases. Now they're creating like a whole quarantine system again. And I think that the more we focus on this, like, did they cure it? Did they not cure it? And those like individual issues, the less we uh, pay attention to, I think, what a bigger storyline is here, which is, what do the places that have managed to contain the coronavirus, not necessarily cure it, but contain it, what do they have in common? What is the common thread that goes between New Zealand or Iceland or some of these other nations that have managed to contain it in a way that places like America or Brazil have not? And this article from The New Yorker, I thought, had a lot of those points really well illustrated. They talked about how the response was calm, how it was fast, how it was decisive, how it was centralized, uh, how people, there wasn't a lot of confusion. There wasn't a lot of he said, she said type of uh, news in, in, in coverage or stories out there. People knew what they were supposed to do. They had clear direction. And because there was clear rational direction from people who were actually experts who were thinking about this, people were more inclined to trust that. And so they didn't sit there saying, well, I don't believe that story. I don't believe this story. I don't believe this science. I believe that science. There wasn't this back and forth that there has been in places like America and places like Brazil. And as a result of that, these places have fared much better because they've resorted to less panic. They've been able to do this in a, such a way that, that uh, people have paid attention. And I think that's been a really, really good lesson for anywhere else because the the lines between what has happened in a place like Iceland and what has happened in a place like America are very 
very clear, super clear. And I think that that is partially because of how this response has gone. And so I appreciated this article in the way that it talked about uh, all of these things. Quick reminder, if you are uh, watching the show right now and you've seen some of these stories, it's because you're subscribed to uh, my email newsletter that comes out every week on Thursday uh, morning. And this is how you can get onto that list. So if you want to get the email with all of these stories, well, most of these stories, uh, this is how you can get it. You can hit this link, uh, go to this link right here, and you can subscribe. You can also join our private communities on Facebook and LinkedIn to talk about these stories after the show. So all of those are ways to get in touch with our community and also to get in touch with me. Another story that I was reading with some amusement this week was what has happened to the last Blockbuster store in Bend, Oregon uh, recently, which is there's an Airbnb happening where you can pay, I think it's like $4 a night, and it's like a couple of nights only, so it's sort of like a limited time promotion, and you can stay in the Blockbuster store, and you can browse the shelves, and you can actually sleep in the store. And it's one of those examples of this really cool nostalgic experience that I think many of us are starting to, to look towards now because we want to re-experience some of those fun things from our past and like staying in a blockbuster store. And I still, I mean, I'm old enough to remember that moment when you would go on a weekend, weekend night to blockbuster and just look at all of these cases and physically sort of, even though all you had was the back cover to read about the book, you could choose based on that. And sometimes especially when we're sitting there flipping endlessly through like all of the options on Netflix or Amazon or any of those places. I kind of wish for that moment where I could go back into a place and just like pick these things up and say, okay, this is the one and like take it to the front and like, that would be it. And once we did that, like we were committed, right? Like once you pick up that video and you go to Blockbuster, you do all that work and then you bring it home. You're like, okay, even if the five, first five minutes suck, I'm still going to watch this thing, right? Because I already paid for it. I already went all the way to the store and I already brought it all the way back. And now uh, if we don't get our attention captured in the first five minutes, it's like, pff, skip, you know, go to the next one. And, and and we just have less patience. And so all of that stuff came up for me just in thinking about spending a night at a Blockbuster. Uh, yeah, maybe I think too much. But anyway, that's like that's what, that's what this made me think of. And I thought that was just a, a cool experience, a really interesting experience. Another story, very futuristic, and, and and I joke about this all the time when I do these keynotes and uh, now virtual keynotes. I talk about the fact that I'm not a futurist in terms of the guy who talks about flying cars. And this week, there actually was a story about flying cars. So this is apparently coming. This looks like a drone, but it's actually a concept for a flying car, and it's large enough to fit a person inside of that uh, kind of sort of concept. And there's a company in Japan that is working on this concept for flying uh, drone-like taxis that could take you from one place to the next. And in the next three years, apparently they have the permission to go off and do a trial of these flying cars. So in our lifetimes, and perhaps in the next decade, the flying car that we've been dreaming about through science fiction for years and years and years might actually become a reality. And so anybody who loves science fiction, who's read some of those stories or who's, who's kind of thought about a different mode of transportation, like this is, this is kind of exciting. Now, who knows if it'll actually work or all the different, I mean, I know there's lots and lots of difficulties with any of these things, but just dreaming of flying cars and being able to see that like in my lifetime, that's kind of cool. Like I like it. Uh, it got me dreaming about it. So Anyway, I wouldn't be one of the first to test these out. I probably, I'm not a test pilot kind of guy, but I think it's kind of cool if it does eventually happen at some point. The Nanavi's double take story of the week, and this is a feature that I do every week where a story came out that got me to just think twice uh, when I saw it. Uh, and this was a campaign. It, it actually was an advertising campaign by a number of different groups that sponsored it, most notably Bailey's uh, Irish Liqueur. And it was a book collection that recognized female authors through time who had used male pseudonyms or who'd used like, you know, pen names that made people believe that they were male instead of female, usually in order to get published or to get the deal to be published. 
And this story had so many layers on it, even though it was kind of a marketing campaign and, and, and interesting in, in that respect, just for that reason, it got me thinking about how many situations there have been where people have changed their name to fit in. They've changed their name when they move from one country to the next uh, to have something that's a little bit easier for people to say. They've abbreviated it in some way. In, in this case, for this campaign, they changed their gender or at least allowed people to think they were the other gender so that they would have more opportunities. And it was it's such a big thing that is underappreciated in history, I think, because it happens so much more than you think. I remember, I think it was maybe last year or the year before, there was this beautiful campaign from Gray Advertising, uh, which is an advertising agency, talking about the history of their advertising company, because they were founded right around the same time as Ogilvy, Leo Burnett, uh, JWT, and all of these agencies, what you might recognize about them is they all are named after someone, and the someone was the founder. And Gray was named after the color of the wallpaper in their office. And the reason it was named after the color of the wallpaper was because the two founders were Jewish. And at that time, that Mad Men era of advertising, they didn't believe that they could get clients if their name of their agency sounded too Jewish. So they changed it to gray. And the beautiful advertising campaign was at a uh, a crossroads moment for the agency it was like an anniversary year, maybe their 50th anniversary. I don't remember exactly. But during that time, they changed the name back to the original name of the two founders. And it was such a powerful reminder that these things that we don't typically remember from the past uh, come back and, and are super impactful and super important to remember because it's part of our history and it's also part of how we've seen this kind of changing and shifting. So um, that story made me think of that. And it also led to what is the non-obvious book release of the week, which is this beautifully titled book from The Captain called Fucking History, 111 Lessons You Should Have Learned in School. And this is a paperback book that essentially does exactly what you think it would. It takes stories from history and it tells them in an interesting way. And it is probably the perfect book to come out right now as school is restarting in a virtual way and we are challenged to get our children more interested in some of the subjects that they're going to be going back to school for. And yes, we want them to be interested in some fucking history because history is important. Like as you've seen from the show today, there's so many amazing stories from history and we can learn from those stories and we should be learning from those stories. And instead of getting them to remember useless dates or, you know, who conquered what from where, all of the stuff that typically history teaches us, like let's shift to teaching them some fucking history and, and tell them about the stories that are most interesting from that past and bring those to life in a way that helps them understand the world today and maybe not repeat the mistakes that we used to make or made in the past with our history. So I highly recommend this book. Uh, I definitely recommend paying attention to stories. Next week, we will be back once more for another edition of the Non-Obvious Insights Show back in our HD studio, exactly where you expect us to be. And we'll have even more stories from another week of fascinating events. And we'll talk about what makes them non-obvious and what you can learn from them for your life, for your work, and for what you do. So thank you for joining me once again for the Non-Obvious Insights Show. I appreciate you and your time. Thank you so much, and I'll see you again next week.